So I want to say welcome, welcome everyone. I'm Marcy Peterson, uh, the director, uh, the technology administrator now for Wheaton Arts. My pronouns are she, her, and I am broadcasting from Southern New Jersey. And I recognize this land as traditionally the land of the Lenny, Lenape. Um, I'll be off camera for most of this presentation, um, but I'll be monitoring the chat with you and for you for your technical and general questions. And that's going to be in the chat box. In the Q&A is where you'll be able to ask our presenters some questions. So please familiarize yourself with those two different features. This conference, Living Traditions, is part of a two-year project, Reflections and Expressions. Wheaton Arts is focusing on the cultural heritage of Central and South America, commun American communities in our area through a two-year multifaceted program featuring exhibitions, educational activities, artist residencies, conferences, rituals, music, and dance performances. Visit wheatonarts.org to find out more about the conclusion of this project in spring of 2023. We'll take a moment to thank our sponsors. Programming for this virtual conference is provided by the Down Jersey Folklife Center, a co-sponsor project of the New Jersey State Council of the Arts and Wheaton Arts. With additional support from the National Endowment of the Arts and National Endowment for, of the, Human, for the Humanities. We appreciate all our sponsors. And I should add that programs like this one are truly possible because of our supporters. They support us through membership, donations, shopping at shop.wheatonarts.org. And I'm going to ask you to please consider exploring these options so we can continue to offer free programs like this. And you can look for those links in the chat. One more time, I will share this schedule, but I will also put it in the chat. Um, so you, if you have to come and go, you'll know what is happening. Um, the recording will be the recording of this presentation as, as is last night's presentations will be on Wheaton Arts uh, YouTube channel in the very near future. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Iveta Pirgova, the Director of the Department of Folk Life and Cultural Studies at Wheaton Arts, and she will be your host for this evening. Hello, Iveta. Hi, Marcy. Thank you for the introduction. I'm so happy we're beginning this exciting day. After last night, I was so uh, enthusiastic how well the conference goes, and we have wonderful presentations for today. Uh, so uh, I would not take up much of your time uh, this time. It, it will be my really great pleasure and honor to present our um, first speaker, Evelyn. Evelyn is a historian of the African diaspora in Latin America and the Caribbean and an assistant professor at the History Department of the University of California at Santa Barbara. She's the author of several articles and finalizing her first book tentatively titled Claiming Dignity, Black Women's Political Contributions to African Diaspora's Political Imaginary in Colonial Venezuela. This book underscores the intellectual contributions of enslaved and free Black women gave to modern ideas of rights, freedom, belonging, and equality. Evelyn is the founder of the annual Artur Skomberg Symposium at uh, Tyler Puerto Ricano in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Going to its 27th consecutive year in February of 2022. Uh, <laughs> she also, oh, actually 23. My mistake, sorry. She also holds um, this another degree in biology from the Universidad Central de Venezuela. Welcome, Evelyn. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to share some time and some wisdom and information with the audience. And I'm thankful that the audience have decided to join us. 
And so um, I've prepared I prepared a, a series of slides to share with you so it would be easier than just me talking uh, because I can talk about this forever. <laughs> but the idea is to have a conversation and I will welcome um, that people will actually post questions on the chat and so we can have a lively conversation. So um, Marcy, please. So before we even go, can you please put the, the slide? So as we as we saw this very you know, short clip, um, this is uh, I wanted to begin the, our conversation by um, having a little clip from Aurelio, who's a musician, Garifuna musician from Honduras, Central America. Um, when we first hear this music, we would actually think about someone perhaps from West Africa because he's not singing in Spanish or French or English or Portuguese, but in Garifuna language. Garifuna language is actually a language that is made of um, indigenous uh, languages and African languages together that are spoken by Garifuna people who live alongside the Atlantic coast of um, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. So we can go now to the next one. Okay, so uh, before we, we begin our conversation about the um, African contributions to the, to the Americas, and especially more specifically Central South America, I wanted to show you something that when the first time I saw it, I was blown out of proportion, especially as we try to understand how we are dealing with racial dynamics that might be really convoluted and Events like these are actually helping us to embrace uh, what we have been conditioned to think as others. This is a vase from um, the Greco-Roman period. And as you can see, yes, it's from antiquity. It's a very old <laughs> uh, vase. And the beauty of this is that it's, it has the carving of two women. Uh, what would be a, an European woman and an African woman. Both of them have, are ornate. Um, they have, the African woman has earrings. The, the vase does not present any kind of disparate in terms of power dynamics or, or more valuable one to the other, showing how at some point um, the relationship between Europe and Africa were not convoluted as they might be today, or that there was no blackness in the sense of of um, something negative, but something that actually was praised of. In fact, the god Zeus may I even be a dark skinned um, god. Can we go to the next one? So uh, more specifically for this uh, conversation, I'm going to talk about, of course, the African cultural, intellectual, and um, technological contributions to the Americas. And I feel important to begin with the expansion of Islam because um, Islam expanded from the uh, Arabian Peninsula through Northwest Africa and uh, Africans from the south of the Sahara and the north expanded and took Islam to the Iberian Peninsula, which is that little head in Europe that is almost red. That peninsula is what holds today the state, the nation state of Portugal and Mexico. I'm sorry, Portugal and Spain. And so I wanted you to see how Islam spread because one of the reasons Africans became more settled in the Iberian Peninsula was through this. Can we have this in the next one? And so in that process, which lasted from the year 711, pretty much until 1492, a sizable number of African men and women made it to the Iberian Peninsula. Some of them came because of their own volition. Some others came as servants or enslaved. Uh, but at that time, almost anyone uh, who was caught in warfare, could be enslaved. This painting is very interesting. If you look at um, the far left, 
there is a man who appears to be drunk and he's being carried, I mean, African men or men of African descent, and he's being carried by two men who have big red hats who are supposed to be Jewish. In the painting, if you go to the other side, on the right-hand side, um, almost at the bottom, there is a, um, a horse. And on the horse, there is also a, a black man and he's actually wearing... A, 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 the clothing he's wearing is depicting that he belongs to the royal uh, entourage. And not only that, he's having the right to ride on horse. Um, and he's only one of the two um, persons riding on horses. There is in the water, there is the boat that seems to have a couple. And there is a woman entertaining the couple. And um, on the back in the center of the square, there is uh, also a man who might be African. He's wearing shorts. He had his cover. And he might actually, um, nobody's sure exactly what's happening with him, but he might be dancing or he might be punished. We don't know. And the, 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 the reason I'm showing this painting is for people to see that there was a period of time, even in the 1400s, 13, 1400s, in which Africans in Europe could occupy all different type of position, not necessarily only being enslaved. They're actually three men on horses, but one of them, as I said, is a man of African descent. So um, it is important to understand the presence of Africa in Iberian Peninsula because that, that was why uh, both Spaniards and Portuguese, and I'm saying that laxly, didn't have problems with drummings and dances and African cultures to begin with and did not try to repress them as much in Spanish-speaking Latin America or in Portuguese-speaking Latin America as it may have happened in uh, English-speaking places where drumming was not allowed. And we hope to the next. And so this is a shorter um, view of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, this actually, by the by the time, by the end of the 14th and 1500s, 1400s, before Columbus uh, departed, um, most, most of the big cities in Iberian Peninsula, like Lisbon, Grenada, Seville, Valencia, um, Cordoba, had a seizable African presence um, in Iberian Peninsula. Can we have the next one? And so, it is important also to notice that not every African person who made it to the Americas, especially at the beginning, uh, made it enslaved. So some when actually traveled with the conquistadors and explorers. Um, there were Africans at the siege of Tenochtitlan, which is today Mexico City. There were Africans present at the siege of Cajamarca in Peru, which was what major challenge to the Inca presence there. Um, certainly, mostly the, the African diaspora to speak with was made of Africans who were captives and were taken through the Atlantic trade of African individuals to the Americas. And so one thing I want to talk about, I refer to the transatlantic uh, trade um, of African individuals instead of, instead of the transatlantic slave trade to underscore that these were African individuals, not necessarily flattening them as slaves. And also, therefore, I, since they were enslaved individuals, I call um, those who enslaved them enslavers. That means the owners um, who or the masters, but I don't use that nomenclature. Can we go to the next one, please? And so one of the few men who actually did not make it enslaved to the Americas was this young man, Juan, Juan Garrido. And he may have been born around the 1480s in West or West Central Africa. He may have been sold, the son of an African ruler, or he may have actually gone to Europe to study as the son of a ruler. He ended up in Lisbon in the year 1503 at a very young age of 15 years. Then he moved to Seville. And then a year after he embarked to Hispaniola. Hispaniola is the island today that is shared by Haiti and Dominican Republic. In 1508, he joined Ponce de Leon, who was the person who first um, embarked in a campaign to Puerto Rico. And then in 1513, he went to Florida. 
And then he must have traveled to Cuba because in 1519, he was with Hernán Cortés um, uh, in a way to Tenochtitlan, Mexico. And that, that campaign departed from Havana. He actually, Juan Garrido, is being significantly believed to have been the first person who ever planted wheat in the Americas. I mean, when they came to the Americas, they found corn, uh, cassava, especially in the tropical area, but they were not familiar with that. And in the, in the, in the quest to recreate something similar to what they have had in, in Iberia, he actually uh, planted wheat. He married in Mexico. He lived very well. At some point, he was very wealthy, but he, you know, at the end, he fell into misfortune and he lost his his wealth. And then he died relatively young by our days, but by then, sixty seven years old was quite old. Um, and so, I just wanted to to point out to this person, bringing and contributing some aspect of his Africanness, but also carrying with him some of the European um, seeds like a wheat. Can we go to the next one, please? And so we're going to see two um, um, depictions, uh, the drawings of that period here. The, the man who is going to receive the necklace is Cortes and the one carrying the, the spear most likely was Juan Garrido. Um, and uh, and he's been greeted by Montezuma. Can we have the next one? And here is another um, drawing from the period. And then Juan Garrido also appears here. And then far right uh, is a woman, um, the one um, known as La Malinche, who was the translator for Cortes. And so that tells you the centrality and the presence of African men and women, eh? women also um, accompany their partners and their husbands. And there are some who actually even after their husbands made it to the Americas petitioned the crown permission to also move to what is today Mexico, for example, or Lima, Peru, which were the main two sites of early Spanish settlement in the Americas. Can we go to the next one, please? So um, most of the African diaspora did come through the Atlantic trade uh, of African individuals. As we notice, the, the arrow of numbers that have corresponding to the number of Africans who made it to the United States is quite small. It is estimated that about 4%, 5% of the 12 to 18, 20 million Africans who were seized and brought to the Americas made it to the US. The majority were taken to the Caribbean, Central, and South America, with the much larger proportion to Brazil. But not every African person who was taken to Brazil stayed in Brazil. Africans also were made to cross in South America, in the southern part, to the Pacific, to the port of what we call today Valparaíso, and then taken um, and traded in, in Lima, in several actually towns in the coastal Peru, or from Cartagena, they were made to walk across what today is the Panama Canal, but then there was no canal, there was land. And then they would be reshipped to Ecuador, Peru, and other parts, Bolivia including. So it is important everybody understand that there is no one place in Latin America who did not have an arrival of a significant number proportion of African men, women, and children. Perhaps the region that might have the lowest is Chile and Paraguay because they were not so big in plantations or uh, agricultural economy, yet the, the cities, the urban centers, um, because there was a drop in indigenous communities in the first part of the colonial period, uh, many Africans were brought to work in domestic service, in uh, plantation economy, mining, and so forth. So yes, Africans made it to every single corner of Latin America. Can we have the next one, please? And so African presence in the Americas contributed and continue contributing in many different ways. And I'm going to just talk about a few. One of them is what I call political imaginary, which means that in the process in which African men, women, and children tried to undo enslavement, they actually created 
political alternatives. Um, the ideas of freedom, the ideas of um, fraternity, the ideas of dignity, the ideas of belonging, which nowadays we call citizenship, all those were proposed in many ways by those who were not allowed to have those rights. Um, um, Africans contributed to the agricultural technology that developed in the United States, Brazil, and Central America and South America, and we're going to look at that. In the culinary aspects, there are so many dishes. Um, one of them, for instance, that is found in the Caribbean basin are dishes wrapped in plantain leaves that people often prepare during the holidays um, in December. Literature, magical realism, which are everyday reality, some people will argue, um, is also very much influenced by uh, African ways of li living life. Definitely spirituality, not only African-based religions, but also the way spirituality is practiced in Latin America certainly has a strong component as indigenous, but it has a strong component as African as well. We need to remember that in some of the urban centers in the early phases of the colonial period, there were more Africans than Spaniards. Uh, in Lima, in Cusco, in what is your, Mexico City, for a long time, there were more Africans than Spaniards. Visual art, obviously music, dance, these were all influenced by significant people of African descent. Next, please. And so part of the political imaginary, I just like to always talk about the Stone Rebellion, which is usually not seen as so relevant. Rebels were mostly from the Congo, uh, Angola region, and most of them must have been soldiers who were captured and, and sold as captives of war. But they, when they organized this rebellion, they did it by playing drums, waving flags, which represents uh, what um, um, an art historian called Cecil Fromont had called sangamentos, which were like ritualized, but also sometimes real battles. In this case, they seized weapons and they killed some because they knew that in Spanish Florida, they could be, become free because Florida at that time was Spaniard and they had this law that uh, enslaved people who ran away and embraced Catholicism will automatically become free. Can we have the next one? Um, Africans brought the base of the knowledge that established the production of rice in large numbers in the Carolinas, in Central America, and Brazil. Um, what especially the, the communities, Africans who came from what is today Gambia, Senegal, the Guinea, um, Sierra Leone, these societies have traditionally been raising a type of rice called Orina Glaverima. And when they were given the Asian the varieties of rice to cultivate, which also needs floodplains, they were the one who knew how to do this. Europeans had not grown rice the way African had done when they arrived to the Americas. It is a, it's a technological expertise that for a long time was not known. And thanks to the work of a geographer called Judith Carney, she had been able to find that not only the ways in which some practices are done, but also tracing in sedimentology and so forth in, um, in, in, in the floor, in the depth of the floor, how this rice uh, was actually was cultivated. And mostly this knowledge was uh, shared by African women who were the one who were responsible for the most parts of the different components that involved raising, um, cultivating rice. Can we have the next one? Am I going too fast? No. Oh, okay. And so here is a, a painting from a drawing from, it's, it's, a, it's a later, but it's a representation of coincidentally African women preparing the land for growing rice. So when we think about eating Carolina rice, we should think and thank African women for actually sharing that knowledge and allowing um, planters uh, to be able to grow in massive ways that they didn't know how to do before. Can we have the next one, please? 
So, um, uh, as I spoke, as I said before, Africans in try to implement every possible strategy to undo enslavement. There is no one person who accepted slavery happily. Uh, enslavement, independently of the conditions and the emotional ties that may have developed occasionally between enslavers and enslaved individuals, was brutal. Okay, there is there was no benevolence in that relationship, and so Africans used African tribunals in Africa before they were sold to avoid being sold into the Americas. Africans revolted at sea and caused insurrection in the ships. They, many of them, purchased their freedom papers. And I, I need to also here call the attention because it was it, this was a practice that was widespread in urban centers in Spanish America. But the first few groups of Africans who were brought to Virginia in the early 17th century also were able to purchase freedom, even purchase land at time, and even establish themselves um, some business and have some moderate success. That would end by the end of the um, 17th century in the United States, but people nonetheless always try to find ways to secure freedom paper. Some people run away, which is called as marunage, and people run away very far at times from where they were enslaved or nearby, and they hid. People are run away for a short period of time to visit relatives or for long periods, hoping to never return to where they left. Some people did it for a night to take a break, to go to a party, because people also wanted to celebrate and wanted to be. In the process, then they created music, uh, blues, jazz, for instance, and many other forms that we're going to look at. Um, those who ran away, some of them established semi-autonomous political enclaves, which are called maroon towns. And some of them were quite sophisticated. And they, many of them organized themselves politically and culturally with an uh, area with uh, farming, a military training camp, because they, they had to constantly then fight the authorities. And in the process, they produced culture. They kept doing music. They were recreating instruments, sometimes like the ones they have known, and sometimes newer ones that they actually came across by meeting the instruments that indigenous people were actually having and used for their own ritual. Music and dance in Africa and African diaspora experience are not only fun, they are manifestation of spirituality and they are ways from healing, which was very much needed among the enslaved communities. And one thing to, to keep in mind, which is always people get surprised, is that within African cosmovision, incorporation of new religion element didn't limit or did it mean that they were completely converting into something else? May we have the, rest, the next slide, please? So there were several maroon enclaves. They were called Palenques, Quilombos, Cumbes, and had other names. Uh, among the most famous one that endured for a long time, there is San Lorenzo de los Negros, which is in Mexico. It's a town that still exists. They had to move from where they were to where they are now. Palenque San Basilio, which resistant was never conquered and dominated, and it still exists, and they have their own language. The Cumbe de Oicota, that one was destroyed in the, 17th in the 18th century. Le Maniel, in, in the border between what was San Domingue and Santo Domingo. Esmeraldas, which still uh, in existence in Ecuador, the Saramaca towns, which is a collection of maroon communities that are still in Suriname, Aconpon, which was in Jamaica, the Buraco de Tatu in Brazil, and Palmares, which um, of all of them seems to have had the most sophisticated organization. Can we have the next one? Okay. And so the Quilombo de Palmares, it was in the northeast part of Brazil. It lasted for at least a century, may have lasted long, longer, which means that several generations of people who were born in Palmares were born free and lived free. It may have had up to 15,000 individuals, we, we think of a full town, Africans and indigenous and a few 
Europeans who did not want to conform to the status quo, the colonial project moved and settled there and developed a semi-autonomous uh, polity. They were very well sophisticatedly organized politically. They did manage to establish an agreement with the authorities, the, the Portuguese authorities in Brazil, but they weren't able to sustain that. There was some internal tension eventually. They were defeated in uh, late 17th, 17th century. However, um, the East history said that they were crucial in helping Portugal keep in Brazil Portuguese because they fought against the Dutch. Can we have the next one? So to celebrate that, in the year 2008, they unveiled the statue of Zumbi, who was the last political leader of Palmares in Salvador da Bahia. Coincidentally, I just happened to be there the day it was open. <laughs> Can we have the next one, please? I hope I'm not getting everybody anybody tired with all this uh, conversation. Anyhow, the next um, um or uh, part of political imaginary I want to share with you is about Haiti. Why? People sometimes um, fall into the idea that Haiti, as it's presented as a place of failure and so on, is actually an amazing place with perhaps that represents the, the base, the fundamental of what I call African diaspora. Um, knowledge and political knowledge and wisdom. So I just wanted to show the location in the Caribbean as is the red spot and um, the other side of the island is occupied by the um, Dominican Republic. And this is in the Caribbean. We have the large island on the, on the left side is Cuba. On the right hand side is Puerto Rico and kind of below is Jamaica. And then we see Central America and the northern part of the northern part of, of South America. Can we have the next one, please? Uh oh, what is this? Okay, and this is um, a closer uh, look at the map of Haiti. I just wanted you to know two things, very simple, that Haiti was producing in the 18th century, Haiti, Sandome, my, my apology, was producing in, in the 18th century uh, about 50% of the sugar that was consumed in Europe and 60% of the coffee that was, that was consumed in Europe. And um, the, the sugar was produced only in the northern part, where it says north, northeast, Artibonite, that's where the sugar was produced. The rest of the island is very mountainous, and so the rest was producing coffee. Um, and, uh, and yet, if you saw how tiny was the map as compared to the Caribbean, it is very small, the, the area that actually was producing this sugar. Therefore, it was producing it in very, very brutal condition. Can we have the next one? So I'm going to give you a really quick overview of the of the what I call the Sandome Afro French Haitian Revolution. I'm I'm changing the name because this is part of the research I'm I'm doing now. So society was very fractured. Um, most of the population was born in Africa, and so it has several stages, and I'm just going to go quickly over them. Um, the first major revolt who happened in, seven, in the late 1750s in which a man called Francois Macandal, who most likely was Muslim and had been enslaved there, attempted to poison all enslavers and make that part of the island independent. He failed. He was captured and executed. The next big attempt happens in 1791, um, where a couple, they were, I don't know if they were a couple, but a man and a woman, that's what I meant to say. It could have been a couple of men or a couple of women. Um, Bookman, Duty Bookman and Cecile Fatima um, summon a voodoo ceremony. And voodoo is not witchcraft. It's a very sophisticated religious practice. I've read about it. And I, the more I read about it, I'm like more mesmerized of the complexity and the spirituality of, of it. So and slave men and women swear they were going to um, start uh, insurrection, and within a few days, they burn 23 plantations out of the 27 plantations that were in the north, in the north of um, Saint-Domingue. Um, 
when um, by that time the French Revolution had been taking place, so what we know about the French Revolution had been taking place, and France and Britain had decided to, to declare war on France because they had remembered uh, got rid of the king and the queen and cut their heads, and so which, which was against the principles of the British Empire and the Spanish Empire. And so the, the officials, the authorities in saint Domingue realized that France could lose its most precious uh, province, and they decided to abolish slavery in the French world. And this happened in 1793 and 1794. But however, things were to change because Napoleon Bonaparte, who took power in 1799, in 1802 decided that he was going to reinstate slavery in the French territories. Well, when Africans in Saint-Domingue found out about that, they decided that they were not going to go back to slavery and they fought the French and on November 18, 1803, they um, defeated the French in the Battle of Altier, which was the biggest loss Napoleon Bonaparte ever had, even though when you Google it, you won't find that. But trust me, <laughs> that's the way it, it was. The person who brought the, the independence of and created the Black Republic of Haiti was called Jean-Jacques de Salines. Um, and on January 1st, 1804, he declared the Black Republic. Next Friday is um, November 18th, and it should be a, a celebration for everybody to go. So shortly after they put together a constitution, and um, these are some of the, the articles of the Constitution that I just not going to go through all of them. But the Article 14, it says all distinctions of color among children of the same father, including the state chief, when necessary, all distinction must stop. Hence, for only be known generically as black. What he meant is that human meant black or black meant human in a moment in which the US, Brazil, and Cuba were about to start a third round of really brutal enslavement, which was by 1805, an extremely complex and visionary idea. I mean, the Salin understood that the world was had been caught up in the process of race making and colorism. And unless it wasn't put in a constitution that could actually impact not only Haiti, but the world. As we know, we still subjected to that problem. He allowed a freedom of worship. I mean, this was a very progressive political imaginary that I, I wanted to under, underline in this talk. Can we go to the first, next one, please? And so the creation of, of the Black Republic of Haiti had a major impact on the world. And, and in some ways, we don't know that because we are just presented with economic and the political turmoil. But in part, our political turmoil is because of the response the world gave to Haiti. So 1803, Napoleon, when was still fighting the, the indigenous army, as it was called, he was broke, needed cash, and so decided to sell Louisiana. So the 13 states had only expanded a little bit, and it wasn't until Napoleon sold Louisiana to the United States that the United States was able to actually begin growing to a, a size closer to what is today. Um, all enslaved men, women, and children look up to Haiti. Um, I know the British Empire had been talking before that about abolishing the trade, but the fact that Haiti came to exist shifted the, the paradigm around the world because nobody thought that Africans could be smart enough to organize themselves and become free. So by Haiti existing, then propelled the path towards abolition of slavery all over because the people knew that sooner or later another Haiti could happen. And so, yes, the British Empire uh, abolished the trade um, but everybody else panicked. And so in a way, it backfired by the level of violence that enslavers exercise on their enslaved communities. But at the same time, that fear of black insurrection kind of prompted some to begin to think of free womb laws. 
And these began to emerge in different places, in different times. I know in the, in the, in the, in the U.S. they came pretty late, but some of them were actually uh, pronounced in the early 1820s. They were not effective, but at least there was a move on this when everybody understood that eventually uh, slavery had to be abolished. Haiti assisted Latin America in becoming Latin America. Um, Simon Bolivar, who was pretty much skinny, sick, desolated, arrived in December 25th in Haiti. And the president of the South, Petion, assisted him. And that's how he was able to go back twice. He got assisted twice by, by Haiti, including a contingency of a, a thousand plus um, soldiers who went back with him to then secure the freedom of Venezuela, Colombia, including Panama, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And Haiti paid expenses for people to call from the U.S. to relocate to Haiti. Do we still have time? How are we doing with time? We are at 341. Oh, okay. So we're, we're a little short. <laughs> Okie doke. Um, maybe we could go one more. Uh, I know you have videos, so we don't want to. Yeah, maybe we can. We don't want to so. skip those. Yeah, well, I just want to say that um, the world embargo at Haiti pretty much since then until now and um, and has consistently undermined Haiti's sovereignty and autonomy. So we can maybe go to another one. And so um, briefly, um, one of the, in addition of, of um, the, what Africans have, marked all over the Americas. One of the events that happens in Philadelphia that I created um, is the annual Arturo Chamber Symposium. And it always happens with the exception of one year, but it usually happens the last Saturday of February in Black History Month to underline that Latinos have all reason to celebrate Black History Month. This coming year, it might actually go from Friday the 24th to the 26th. And if anybody wants more information about Taller Puerto Riqueño or the Annual Arturo Chamber Symposium, you can please go and check on that um, website, Taller website. Um, I wonder if we can pause for questions. Are there any questions? So in the beginning, when you were talking about the uh, arrival of expansion of Islam and arrival of um, Africans in Spain and Portugal and from there to um central and south america um there was a question danielle wanted to ask whether these africans were mostly muslims the first ones uh, to to arrive yes they were they were they arrived in 711 the year 711 and most of them had converted to islam um the west east africa around kenya tanzania and so on converted to Islam as well as pretty much so south of the Sahel and North of Sahel people converted. And so the Sahara has not been a, a war preventing people from going up and down. So South Af I mean, Sub-Saharan Africans have gone to Northern Africa and vice versa. So, so when that ex expansion happened, yes, um, they were all Muslim. And this is actually the period of splendor of Islam where Timbuktu had a center of knowledge, Cordoba, Granada. This is the time in which um, most of Europe was in the dark ages while uh, is Islamic scholars were transcribing Homero's plays and Plato and Aristoteles. They were translating that to Arabic and thanks to that, they were not lost to the Europe and the world. Yeah. All right, so the, the, the first ones were mostly Muslims and the, the next waves that came mostly through the, the, the slave trade uh, were African-based religious uh, systems. Yes. Okay. yes, yes. Yeah, in the so, 1400, a lot of um, them, as Portuguese merchants began to explore, um, they began to trade in, and some of, they were trading of all goods. And um, because, and as warfare intensified in some African polities, then you have a mixture of African men, women, and children 
Uh, most of them were not Catholic. Some of them actually were still because some people mm -hmm. were converting. And those were the, the second wave that goes to the trans. It's a, it's a trade that goes from West, West Central Africa to the Iberian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, she also wants to know um, uh, if you could explain a bit more the free womb law. These were a series of laws mm -hmm. that were passed beginning the 1820s, 1816, 1820s, that stated that enslaved women will deliver children who had the right to be free after they worked for their owners, for their enslavers, for 16 years. They, they changed to 18 years. Then they changed it to 21 years. And in places like Peru, they changed it to 50 years. And the idea was that because throughout the Americas, there was a law called partus sequitur ventrum. This is in Latin, that all children and slave women delivered had the condition of the mother and not of the father. So even when enslaved women um, bear children of free men, those children follow the condition of the mother. And so the free warm laws were to make created to give hope from that point on that the generation will be born free instead of enslaved. Mm. All right. And the last question, uh, Michael is asking you to please talk about the Blacks that left Philadelphia to settle in Samana, which is now part of the Dominican Republic. Yes, um, one of the, 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 the laws or the principle that uh, Haiti established was first to intercept ships carrying enslaved Africans and to take them to Haiti. And the other one was to invite um, black men, women, children, and indigenous people who were held enslaved anywhere to move to Haiti and become citizens right away. I mean, they will receive asylum immediately and within a few months or a year, they become citizen. And so at some point in the 1830s and the 1820s and 30s, um, they actually invited African-Americans who were having a rough time in the U.S., who wanted to move to then, then it was the entire island because Haiti had control of the entire island. And so they actually pay tickets. So people left from New York and Philadelphia, my understanding, and moved to, to what is today the, the peninsula of Sama, where you still have a presence of um, a, a Protestant practitioner as compared to Catholic, which is uh, the main the, the religion mostly practiced in Dominican Republic. And so they were given land, it wasn't not only the, 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 the expense to cover the travel, but they were also given land. To show you the, the depth of this political um, imaginary and the inclusion of everyone who, had, who were being presented or imagined as outsider, as others are less than. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for explaining this, uh, Evelyn. Uh, well, I would suggest that um, uh, we go back to the examples now because we have 10 minutes uh, to four. Uh, maybe show a few examples and, and have the last five minutes uh, for last questions and wrap up. Yes, yeah, so we're going to then have a little sample of different kind of Afro, Latin American music. And we're going to begin with two Afro-Catholic festivals that takes place in Venezuela. The first one is the, um, for St. John's Day. It's usually celebrated on June 24th. Yes. El culepuya es, es, es una, es música y danza eh, típica de Curiepe, pero también típica de algunos otros and so we can see this other one. This one is Timbangles. So this is the flag, and they're carrying the San Benito de Palermo, the black saint of. So while the festival that we saw before has a Congo Angola origin, this festival has the Ibiobio Nigerian Calabar origin. 
to show you that is the complexity and the diversity is so broad that you even have uh, cultural practices that you can trace exactly where they came from. You can go to the next one. This is actually from Mexico, North America. This is known as the Son Jarocho. And the men with glasses have devoted several decades to research um, Son Jarocho, which is Afro-Mexican music style. La Bamba is a, is a Son Jarocho song. We can go to the next. We're going to play a little bit of modern Haitian music. This is a very mellow kind of song. Haiti to Badu. Keke Belisia, Fabi Susi. Mavo. Can go to the other form of um, so the one that you're listening here is called compa, and this one is actually more associated with carnivals. The one on the right on your screen. So I hope you are noticing the variety of drums that we're seeing and rhythms that have come. And of course, none of these are pure. I mean, please also enjoy the innovation of people here and the incorporation also of indigenous instrumentation and musicality. As you can see, this is very different than the previous one that was very mellow. This is more lively and this is kind of like the big music doing carnival. We can continue. So this is Gaga. The other one was Pompa. Now we're going to see a little bit of or listen to me. This is from El Limón in Costa Rica. The Limón is an Afro Costa Rican community, which they were not recognized as citizens of Costa Rica until the 1950s, but they, they are. Many of them are descendants of and slaves who were born during the colonial period, plus people who moved from Jamaica and Trinidad um, during the boom, the banana boom in Costa Rica in the 20th century. That's why there is a connection with the English. Thank you. So then we can go to another place now, um, Panama. Morita Panameño is one of the national dance styles. And while we might claim that the dressing and the outfit might be more Spanish looking like, the dancing, the music, the sound remind us of the bomba from Puerto Rico. So 
okay so i think we can stop here now because time is moving um no señor esa sí es palma this is from Caribbean Colombia, very famous singer, Tutu La Mampocina. We can conclude with this because time is running. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if there is any other question. It's uh, it's really a pity that you we are cutting it short because you have such wonderful examples of music, Evelyn, and people are putting comments in chat. You will see them later. Really enjoying the music. But uh, uh, you will also notice that Marcy is putting the links to these videos in the chat. Good. So uh, if everyone saves their chat, they can listen to, to them later and see them in, the, in full length, not just the very short excerpts that we are providing here. Yeah. Uh, but um, we have uh, time for one question. Um, Michael is asking if you can uh, talk a, a little about Tumba. Francesca uh, from Guantanamo, Cuba. About what? About Tumba. Francesca. I don't think I can talk about Tumba. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so maybe, Michael, you can put in chat. Um, about I will research Tumba. about Tumba. All right. So, well, we have two minutes left, uh, Evelyn. If you want to make some concluding remarks. Well, um, well, this is a great one. I mean, I don't know what Tumba is to tell you how rich the patrimony um, Africans brought to the Americas is. Um, Cuba, for instance, Cuba, Puerto Rico are two sites where you're going to find a wealth and especially Cuba. And because Africans were more than half a million Africans were brought to Cuba in the 19th century. So Cubans were arriving until very late into, Africans were arriving to Cuba until very late. And that's why actually a lot of the prayers and, and Santeria are still done in ancient Yoruba. Actually, when Yoruba wants to learn those prayers, they have to go and look for Cubans to teach them about that. And something similar happened in Brazil as well. Cuba, Brazil, Puerto Rico, but you name it, wherever you go, the wealth of African contributions from the cultural, political, spirituality is enormous. And we still have not really fully explored them all. I will definitely explore what Itumba is about, especially next time I'm in Cuba. Thank well, you. Uh, right now, Michael put it in chat that Tumba is uh, a mix of Cuban and Haitian influence and the music is very intense, but the ladies dance with the same grace as uh, the ones from Panama. So um, he's comparing Tumba with the, the example he saw on the video from Panama. Uh, it will be interesting if you want to go further into this research. Well, yeah, there is a very strong connection between Haiti and Cuba. During the revolution, a lot of people ran away from San Domé into Cuba. That was the first one. But then after, during the late night, during the 19th century, many Haitians were taken to Cuba to work in the sugar plantations. And um, that kind of kind of reinforced that connection. And, uh, and that community, in fact, my husband's grandmother may have been born in Cuba. Her name is, her name was Mercedes. And so thank you so much for, I mean, I knew of this connection, but I didn't know what's called Tumba. Um, <laughs> I, I will definitely look into this more, more carefully. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, it, it was really, really very interesting, very enlightening pre presentation. And um, meanwhile, Marcy put all the video links in the chat, even Great. the ones that we were not able to show at this time, so people can watch them on their own after that. Thank you so very much, Evelyn. So, uh, it, well, it's, uh, it's uh, almost four o'clock, so it is time that I welcome our next presenters. There will be two presenters um, for the last session of this conference. Um, Naomi being one of them and Andres uh, the other. Uh, a folklorist and ethnomusicologist by training, Naomi currently serves as the executive director of the Philadelphia Folklore Project. She's also the founding executive director of the media arts collective Los Herederos and a co-founder of the Quechua Collective of New York. Naomi specializes in urban and immigrant folk life, indigenous and mestizo traditions of the Americas, South Asian folk arts, and water lore. Her practice centers around interdisciplinary ethnography and working collaboratively in communities to harness traditional knowledge in service of social change. It is her deeply held belief that local knowledge both sustains communities and advances the quality of urban life. Naomi holds an MA in ethnomusicology from Columbia University and a BA from Bowdoin, Bowdoin College. Her public folklore work media publications and writing deal extensively with issues of ethnic identity, political economy and cultural sustainability, transmedia, storytelling and documentation, and exploring new models for holistic economic development through folk life-centered cultural tourism. She continues to develop her decade-long work on transnational Andean music in New York City and beyond through an interdisciplinary multi-sided project called Urban Condors. And uh, I would like to say a few words about Andres. Andres Jimenez <clears throat> is a practitioner, teacher, and performer of traditional Andean music, specializing in Peruvian Quechua folk songs, A multi-instrumentalist, um, he plays flutes, vocals, pan pipes, strings, and percussion, as is common in a traditional characterized in, tra in a tradition characterized by communal practice uh, and performance. Andres also plays a range of traditional genres from Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, with heritage from uh, Apurimac and the northern coast of Peru. Andres hails from a musical family, first learning Quechua folk songs from his mother and the recordings she kept in their home. Over the years, he apprenticed and recorded with many of the area's Andean music greats, such as Guillermo Guerrero, Pepe Santana, and Jose Alberto Ruiz. In the 1990s, he founded the ensemble Inca Songo with his uncle Carlos Ambia, and later, in 2010, his current band, Inca Raico, through which he seeks to brand a unique New York Andean sound, Andres is also a licensed social worker. Welcome both of you, Naomi and Andres. I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you, Iveta, and hello, everybody. Um, it's our honor to be here together and uh, co-present. I'm going to share my screen as well now. We have a PowerPoint to accompany what we're going to be discussing. So our, pro our presentation today is entitled Urban Condors, Traditional Andean Music in NYC and Beyond. And basically our presentation is gonna have two parts. I'm gonna start by talking a little a bit about the work that Andres and myself have been collaborating on for now over a decade, which we refer to as the Urban Condors Project, but also in company, 
<laughs> encompasses, sorry, um, his band that I also work with him on, Inca Raiku. So it's a project that is both archival and also performance-based and programmatic. And so I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes giving a little overview of that project, how it came to be, our working relationship. Then we'll open it up for some questions. And then we're going to switch gears a little bit and do like a live radio or like a live TV interview um, where Andres is going to take the lead on discussing a lot of the salient issues uh, and themes that are most important to this project. And in the middle of that, I believe we'll have a moment for questions and then again at the end. So the Urban Condors project is a long-term project. It's something we've been working on now for the better part of a decade. And so we do call it a multi-year and a multi-sided interdisciplinary project, but it's also a mixed media archival collection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and how those two things come together. Um, but what it really looks at is Andean music, memory, migration, and place spanning five decades and three generations and two continents. Urban Condors maps Andean traditional music, its scene, and its following in New York City, as well as the tri-state area, tracing its lineage through several bands and familial practitioners. The collection represents an important historical document of NYC's Andean music scene from its inception in the early 1970s into its more matured present-day state, with deep roots in Rockland and Westchester counties, as well as the state of New Jersey. And so we bring that up because while um, most of the work that Andres and I have been doing over the years is very New York City centric. We recognize really, really important Andean communities in the state of New Jersey. In particular, we wanted to bring that in since this is a conference with Wheaton Arts and thinking about, you know, communities and cultures of the state of New Jersey as well. And so we do have those connections and they are very strong between the different, different locations and the different communities. Um, so in terms of how all this began, Yvette did a wonderful job introducing Andres and myself, and we both wear many hats and have different jobs. I know a lot of people, you know, watching probably know me as either the director of the Philadelphia Folklore Project or a public folklorist and other jobs that I've had over the years. Many probably know Andres as a performing artist. Uh, he's also a social worker and a curator and a cultural worker himself. But we've actually been collaborating together since 2006. We talked about this a little earlier, trying to connect the dots. And we met, I was actually beginning to work as a public folklorist with a program in Queens called Pachamama Peruvian Arts. He was a teacher of Andean music there. And that's how we initially met and began to work together. I was also very interested um, in Peruvian music and culture. That was very much the focus of my graduate work. And eventually my dissertation research, which was focused on Andean music and Andean musicians in NYC. And I credit a lot of that interest and passion uh, to Andres as both my musical teacher um, and also a colleague and a coworker uh, who had a lot of these same questions and projects of his own. And it really allowed for a really special multi-year community engaged collaborative practice that ultimately uh, probably didn't make me a great academic or graduate student because my goals were a little bit elsewhere, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily change that and, and eventually did give rise to um, what is this more public focus and archival project, Urban Condors. <clears throat> so after we'd met and we began working together for a while, Andres had asked me to help him with his band at that time, as you saw in his bio, he has started a number of and played in a number of different musical groups over the years, but he had been conceiving of a new next generation group in Karaiku, which would play Andean traditional music, but from his perspective as a second generation, um, you know, Brooklynite, New Yorker, create a more urban Andean sound, indigenous, no pun intended, but to the experience of, of New York and being a New Yorker. Um, and he wanted to see if I might help him in, in planning out that group, administrating that group and getting that off the ground. And he also introduced me to his mother, who had a huge impact on my life, who's a Quechua language speaker and activist and teacher. And she was interested in starting an organization to perpetuate Quechua uh, in and amongst Peruvian and Andean communities in New York. And I helped her to do that. And so in all of this public folklore work that I was doing over the years and field work that I was doing, um, it became clear to me that there was a really unique story of Andean traditional music as performed by 
um, a number of different uh, families and individuals, kind of a certain lineage of, of traditional musicians that had begun emigrating from the countries of Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador in the 1970s when that immigration started, and continuing on in different ways to the present day. And you know, when I think about why it's important or what was sort of the reason to, you know, build out this project, I realize I should have changed my slide, I'm sorry. Um, there were a couple different things. You know, one thing I think about a lot as a native New Yorker myself is the soundscape of the city um, and also what genres and things get playtime. And when thinking about the sort of Latin music or Latin American musical soundscape of such a diverse and cosmopolitan place as New York, um, I think this is changing now, but back in the early 2000s when we started this work and, and previously, there really wasn't a tremendous appreciation and recognition for Andean music practice in New York. I think in the 70s and 80s, it was stronger because of certain sort of social currents, obviously, like Simon and Garfunkel's Condor Pasa had come out. There was definitely certain social energy of the time that was interested in traditional music and particularly indigenous traditional music in a different way than it was at that time. But when you looked at the kinds of genres and the kinds of space and playtime for, for this music, it was, a, it was, there wasn't a lot of rec recognition within like a larger Latin American so that was on one impetus. Um, and there was also another thing that I had talked a lot about with Andres, which was a misunderstanding about the diversity of Andean music practice. And it's not to say that any style or scene is bad or wrong, but there was, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, Andean music is what I hear in the subways. It's kind of a, a world beat, you know, kind of thing, or maybe the Condor Paso. There was kind of an oversimplification of what Andean music was. And from working with Andres and um, many artists and colleagues that, you know, were our friends, I knew that there was this tremendous story and history around um, you know, traditional artists who had immigrated to the city and kept this music alive in smaller or larger spaces, pass it on to their children, to friends, to their students. And it was actually a very, you know, a very alive and robust scene in its own way. And so I, I thought this is a story that really should have a little bit more focus um, and be people should be more aware. And it also was very important to the sustainability of the tradition, because if there's not spaces for artists to play and there isn't an appreciation for the music and a recognition for its diversity. You can pass it on in the home for sure, but it's gonna be hard to do that generation to generation. So these were some of the things um, that we were thinking about. And also, as I said before, Andres was getting ready to start this group in Garraiku, where he had already started a little bit. And there was this idea of understanding Andean music and indigenous sounds, yes, as, um, you know, highly traditional music, age-old music from, from the mountains of South America, from small villages. Yes, a rural tradition in many ways in its roots, but also an urban practice and understanding how these sounds had evolved and how they were also very much a part of daily life in these other spaces. So these were some of the things I was thinking about that we thought it'd be really important, as I said, initially sort of as a dissertation project, and then eventually as more of a public folklore project and a community-driven archive that we put together. And so, you know, in doing a lot of that field work, myself and also alongside other photographers and documentarians in the community, folks like on this, we began to compile um, the archive, which was, you know, as I said, a combination of this contemporary field work, but then also you know, Andres's mother is saying to me, oh, I have all these VHS tapes of the bands playing over the years that I've taped of my son and my friends. And, you know, they're sitting on my shelf and they're going to melt. Can we digitize them? Can we save them? Oh, I have these, you know, people having albums of family photos, other types of home videos, um, you know, people on Facebook resurfacing with great photos, you know, from childhood. And so I began to work with different people to see how we could put this all together in a archive that would be a collection, I should say, not a full-blown archive, but a collection that I would build, but also which would have joint copyrights with everyone. People could continue to control their materials, have access to the materials, but that I could also you know, fundraise around and build it out for safekeeping because there was this important story to tell. And we were thinking, oh, it might be great someday to produce a film about this or publish something about this. 
but we only need to have the archive intact when we need to have a record of this work in order to do that. And so a big, a big piece of this urban condors project, as we call it, has been to put together this mixed media community archive and figure out how to make that accessible and usable. And then there's been this other piece, which is around programming, which, you know, to date has really been through the work of Inca Raiku, the band that Andres um, founded and that I work with him, you know, to administrate and to, to uh, do storytelling and program curation around. And we have many dreams for the future, as I said, things we'd like to see how this project can grow, mostly in the media sense of, as, as I said, perhaps producing a documentary, having a radio program, something of that nature. But also really the most contemporary manifestation of this has been in embodied live practice of the group in Karaiku. So we're looking at you know, the history of Andean music from these countries, and then also this group that really brings it together. And so I'd like to pass it over to Andres at this time to just talk a little bit about the founding of Inca Raiku, and then we're going to play a video, a short, a short documentary piece we made a number of years ago that also tells both the story of the group, but also the larger mission of our work. Andres? Hello, everybody. Yes. So Inca Raiku was born because I... I you could say very in a very simple way, I wanted to do things my way after having played in other bands and learning what I could learn from those people. I I had a I had a feeling that I'm glad, I'm very respectful and I'm very grateful for having all this knowledge, but but there are other songs and other genres and um all the ways to present this music that I would like to do, but when you're not the director of the, of those groups, you know, you, you, you just have to go along. So I decided, okay, that the, the time is right. I think I have enough knowledge to, to do this. And I wanted to sort of like form like a, a super group <laughs> of me and my friends, meaning, okay, I'll represent Peru. I'll get my other friend uh, from Ecuador, my other friend from Bolivia, and you know these three particular countries will be very well uh, represented. So that's how in in Karaiku uh, was born. This was around the year two thousand ten, maybe perhaps a little earlier, and uh, then shortly afterwards, actually the group fell apart. Sad to say. <laughs> For various reasons, and it was sort that we sort of took a little hiatus, but then it was reformed again, and the latest version, I guess, in a sort of a same mission statement, but maybe a new, new direction, a new way of thinking of how to actually present ourselves began around 2012, when uh, Naomi actually became involved and she became the manager, and actually the the. The very first project was let's make a video to introduce the, the world on social media, through social media, who we are and what we're trying to do. And I think that, are we going to see that now? Is that yeah, the, yeah, we'll share that. That's a great segue. <laughs> so yeah, so that was one of the first projects we did was to create, I mean, yes, a promotional video, a kind of about the band video, but also very grounded in this story and this history and the archive that you had, Andres, you know, with different photos and pieces from your past. So I'll play that now. There's a little too much reverb on that thing, man. <laughs> There's no reverb. On your vocals? Karaiku is a, is a word, a Quechua word. That means uh, because of the Inca. I chose the, the word because it, it, it means a lot of things. Because of the Inca, Peruvians are proud, or Andeans are proud. Because of the Inca, we're still here playing music. Because of the Inca, where we try to emulate them in, in many ways. Because of the Inca, we are still speaking Quechua today. So 
Inca Raiku was born because uh, the other group that I was in and I directed Inca Kusi Sonko, which started out as a dance group, Peruvian dance group. For about five years, six years, we did, we specialize in Peruvian Quechua music. At that time, I decided, okay, I have learned and I, to, to appreciate and respect Quechua music, Quechua culture in general, something I'm going to, to do forever. It's part of me, it's my culture, it's who I am. My sister used to be part of uh, Inca Kusi Sonko, which was uh, the group we all used to play, most of us used to play with. They've been around for a long time, but uh, I, um, they were, they're kind of like semi-retired now because most of the people in the group were like, like elders and they moved on. So the younger crowd kind of formed this group, Inca Raiku. Totally indigenous, um, which to me, that, that's like the, just, that's how you connect. I believe that our sound came from one source uh, many moons ago, many eons, whatever you want to say it. I believe we're much older as a, as a civilization than what we think we are, what we were led to believe, and that at a certain point in time, all cultures were one. Like for instance, like there's a lot of similarities between like Irish folk music and the Inca music. There's a lot of similarities between the Inca music and, and the Chinese, ancient Chinese music uh, on Mongolians, and, it's, it's, and they usually deal with the pentatonic scale, and it's, it's always, again, about praying to the unknown, the source, the giver of life. Most of these sounds are lost through time, but we, we try to, we do our research and we try to recollect all of that and, and express it, embrace that. We're trying to promote um, our culture, trying to keep, tell the audience that um, we're American, but we play our music from our background, that uh, we connect with our roots. We don't let the, what makes us, what made our generation before us, um, what we are today. We want to keep the tradition alive, but also incorporating you know, the modern lifestyle, which you know, we are paying tribute to today's time, at the same time giving respect to where we came from. This is our this is our base, this is our roots. The Quechua traditional music from the Andes. Now we're going to to branch out into other things using our foundation. We're going to try and and do fusion. Could be with rock, could be with RB, funk, reggae, cumbia, disco, and you name it. general audience, anyone who likes music, who appreciates um, different culture from uh, South America, anything that's not um, modernized. I've seen a pattern that with those people from who, who aren't, who aren't uh, South American, they enjoy our music even more. And, and I, I love to see when at the end of each performance, for instance, they, they they, they dance and they're willing, they, they go out of the way to, you know, and they, they really enjoy. this, we want you to know this, we want you to learn more and appreciate the Quechua culture, Inca culture, 
but we are part of the modern world. We are all Americans. Before we continue uh, with the next part of our presentation, Iveta, are there any questions from the audience or things you'd like us to clarify? Yes, they are. Thank you very much for asking. I mean, this is such a good, uh, I mean, people find it very inspirational, uh, this uh, project, and we can only hope that maybe after that other communities will conceive similar projects for of their own. But uh, there are a few questions at this time. Um, uh, Michael is asking, um, have you encountered Aymara speakers, Peruvians uh, and Bolivians in New York? And, and do you feel that their language and music are well represented in the area? So I'm gonna actually, I'll pass this one over to Andres. Um, I think he has, he th things to say about that, but the short answer I would say is yes, absolutely. And Andres, if you wanna maybe add to that. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, Quechua is definitely much, much more common. But Aymara, the language and the culture is alive and well. Uh, but what people need to understand is that uh, Aymara, the Aymara culture itself only comes from specific parts of Bolivia and Peru. So it wasn't, if you're thinking in the terms of the Inca Empire, it wasn't all over the empire. So it's in a certain part of based mostly in a certain part of Peru called Puno and also in, in parts of Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And some places spoke a mix of Quechua and Aymara and then of course uh, Spanish. But the, but it's, all, it's in the music because a lot of the music we play, like you saw the big pipes in the video, for example. Yes. That's from, that's from the Aymara culture. Okay, mm -hmm. that's like Aymara melodies, I, and we don't, we don't, you know, say a Bolivian or a Peruvian at this point because it's going back too far, and I don't like to be nationalistic about these things. I just, more, for me, it's more respectful to say that's Aymara music. I don't say Peru or Bolivia, and so we share that. That's a commonality between uh, Peru and Bolivia, and <laughs> the, of course, in the in the clothing people wear when there's performances. That's also Aymara culture. And as far as the language, though, the language, and when we, there are certain songs we sing, which are a mix. And when I perform with other groups in the past, we did sing some songs in Aymara, and I always felt a little uncomfortable because I didn't know what, what I was saying. <laughs> so I solved this problem by learning Quechua. Well I'm, well, I'm still learning. I'm still at a very basic level. But Aymara is very similar, and I found that actually Quechua, a lot of Quechua comes from Aymara. And but I don't know honestly right now I could be wrong of any groups, active groups that uh, feature Aymara language. But definitely the music is there. So and dance as well, the dance. So any you could say any music or dance from the Altiplano region of Peru or Bolivia, it's a good chance that it has uh, Aymara influence. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andres. Um, actually, you uh, answered in part uh, a next question uh, that is about the clothing. Um, Daniel is asking whether this is part of the tradition for the music. Uh, do you wear this clothing always when you play and what, what can you say about it? Yes, in fact, I'm thinking this is probably common in most cultures, indigenous cultures, but for Andean culture in general, what you dress specifically to represent actually your tribe or your, your culture or your clan or your town. And in fact, if you look at how people are dressed, you can recognize, oh, they are from here. Oh, they are from there. And that's, that's I, think, I, I think that's common, of course. That's a universal thing. So... Definitely cl clothing is important and it's it's not just thrown together at random it, and certain dances from certain places, of course, they are wearing the traditional clothing that that goes with that dance in that place. So yes, and there are some always similar and some and even there is, of course, Spanish influence 
and some of the things uh i think one of the most uh curious examples is uh european influence spanish influence the Mm -hmm. The people from the Altiplano, the women in particular, who have a high status, they wear a bowler hat. The the cholas, it's a it's a bowler hat, but this became like you know hats in general and all and in societies, indigenous societies were also status symbols, and this bowler hat represented could represent a high status of wealth in the community. Thank you, Andres. Uh, and so the the clothing that we saw in the video, where is it exactly from? Oh, the ponchos that we wear? Yeah. Ah, it's it's interesting. So I, I bought these ponchos and I had them custom made because we are taller than normal Bolivians. And I had them made longer. But the, the colors, right, the marks, I found out later. I didn't know at the time that I bought them. I just like, oh, wow, this is a beautiful maroon color. I, I, I was going to originally buy just red. And my wife told me, that's boring. Everybody wears red. Get another shade. And I said, okay, this is one that's very nice. But then later on, I found out, we, when I went to uh, I went to an activity in the south of Bolivia, uh, the Chutilios Festival, I saw a, a group of, of dancers and musicians from Tarija, Bolivia, and they had the exact same poncho. And I didn't <laughs> know that it was their poncho. I just bought it because it looked nice in the shop. But nobody explained to me. But then I found out that actually the Tarija culture is a very, very linked culture to the Argentinian culture, the Gaucho culture. And in fact, if you go to Salta, Argentina, it's also the same poncho. So you can see from Salta to Tarija, Salta, Argentina, to Tarija, Bolivia, to, to New York City, we're wearing uh, th this poncho. But it's, the that is the, the poncho, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what a nice story. <laughs> that is nice. All right, so just two more questions. Um, uh, I'm reading the first one from Michael. Um, he says, I met an Ecuadorian group originally from Otavalo called Remise, who was selling its CDs on the Atlantic City boardwalk about 20 years ago. They played both the Andean music that you play and the San Juanito from northern ecuador have you heard of them and if so do you know if they still exist oh wow 20 years that's, whew, that's <laughs> but i i used to have I've, i still have a very extensive uh, you know recording collection on cassettes you know magnetic tapes but i have never heard of them uh rimai is a quechua word it means to speak so i would have remembered them uh, maybe it's, it's possible I have heard recordings by them, but I didn't know it, it was them. So I honestly don't know, but I bet if you search on YouTube, and this is the magic of YouTube, which we're going to talk about a little later, is uh, people are uploading, they're like taking out their cassettes and vinyl LPs, and they're uploading them to YouTube, and it's an amazing, like, universal collective archive that, uh, that it's, it's beautiful because all these recordings that you thought I'm never going to hear this stuff again. Like you could, oh, Rimai, what's up with that group? Do they still exist? You could start there, you know, and you might actually hear the music that you that you experienced so many years ago. <laughs> but we do well, play San Juanitos uh, from you, Ecuador. All right. That rhythm. Thank you. Uh, well, um, Marilyn says many years ago when. Um, I was staying with a, an Ecuadorian family of uh, Guayquil, Guayquil, I'm not sure it's uh, Guayquil. Uh, Guayquil. The woman uh, who became my sister had negative things to say about Andean music, uh, that it wasn't worth listening to. How do urban Ecuadorians and Peruvians feel about traditional Andean music? Oh, I know why she said that. So from Guayaquil, right? Yes. Okay. So this is uh, the classic people from the coast who are more urban or think they're more urban and sophisticated, who, who are taught to look down upon people from the country or the mountains as a bunch of ignorant hillbillies, indios, cholos. That yeah. doesn't happen too much anymore, but it was a concern even as much as 20 years ago when I started doing this music. And I would say that 
for these types of people, because I have Ecuadorian friends both from the Andes and from Guayaquil, and mm -hmm. I did notice that still sort of exists. And I said, well, I'm not going to fault him. If that if that's what his parents taught him and that's what his culture taught him, that's a shame. But I'm not going to debate with him. All I will say to him is, listen, if you like the music, you like the music. You don't like it, you don't like it. <laughs> I'm not asking you to accept it or have a debate with you about if you're descendant from Andy and people or not. So, it, you know, I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to, I want to avoid confrontation. I just want everybody to embrace Race to music. This happens, I think, in Peru as well. Uh, but I, that is one of the, my goals, actually, to be honest with Inca Reku. Because, yeah. because of, cause you can see me, I'm not a timid person. I'm very outspoken and I'm very proud of what I do. And I'll say to anybody, I don't know what you heard, but okay, sit down, listen to us play. And if I, I, at the very least, you can say they did a good job and they're very competent musicians. Maybe you're not going to like what we played, but I, I'm telling you, I, I doubt it. Because a lot of the indigenous music has been incorporated into urban cumbia music. So a lot of these people from Guayaquil and a lot of these people from Lima, for example, they know this music and they like it. They just have been, it has been presented to them in another form and they didn't even know it. So it's actually a huge contradiction, but but you can't argue with them because they don't know any better. They're ignorant. So, but it's okay. Once I sh I can I explain these things to them and they they can understand that. Like, you know, I feel like okay, I did my job. You know, people have to understand these beautiful melodies and these beautiful flutes. You know, you you have heard of them and you do like them. You just maybe you didn't realize it. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you said, part of it is um, just ignorance. But yes. uh, Marilyn did say it was many years ago, so things uh, may have changed by now. And from what you said, it seems it's um, slowly changing. So yeah, I think it's changing. It, it and it's it's a good thing to hear. All Especially right, because of social media. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Andres. Uh, well, let's uh, let's continue then with your presentation, and we'll have uh, a few more minutes at the end for more questions. Okay, um, and Iveta, I do have a quick question about that. Uh, is it okay if we? It's it's three four thirty eight now. So is it okay if our next part goes a little past four forty? Uh, I think it's okay because uh, you're the last presentation. Okay, and we'll just uh, use whatever is left. A few, a few minutes, yes, because th we did the same thing last night. I mean, okay. the first presentation had to to stop on the dot because there was another one after that, but yours is the last one, so a few minutes shouldn't be a problem. But we still want to to have a few minutes for a chat after. Understood. Uh, Understood. All right. So we'll we are, we'll we'll we'll. Yeah. And Naomi, if you can just uh, speak a bit more slowly, sometimes your um, sound is um, gargled and some oh, words okay. are lost. Apologies about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So for this next uh, part of our presentation, as I said, we thought we would do like a, a live podcast style interview uh, between Andres and myself, kind of going back and forth with the experience over the years. Um, of doing this project. And so Andres, to start out, I'm wondering um, if we can talk a little bit about what it's been like to build this archive collection together. Um, and if you can talk a little bit about what the power of archiving has meant to you for your practice and for the group. Sure, sure. So ever since I, I met Naomi, what how, what how she impressed me was that she was like, and even from her background, well, I remember what she told me, like, because she was always a folklorist and she was always heavily into uh, folk music from the from North America, I believe. And what she told me was that maybe the music sometimes is not that appealing, but there's, there's always a story and the lyrics are very, very important and the narrative is there. So that's how I, 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 I accepted this philosophy. I said, yeah, she's absolutely right. It's not enough just to listen to you know, pretty melodies, you know, instrumentals, there's a story and it is, it's got to have lyrics, right? And it's got to have meaning behind those lyrics. And that's, that's how uh, we sort of married our, our two philosophies and, and the power of archiving. It was huge because 
you know, back in the old days when everything's analog, uh, I, I, well, let's 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 go back actually to the real, the original archive, right? It's it's people, right? Uh, your either your parents or teachers, you know, they're the ones who are are transmitting the knowledge to the new generations, whether it's through you know through voice or song or dance. There's there's information there, you know. There's always information, so the story is important because some people don't get the link between the three, but the information is there. So I had my mom, right? She was a person. She was an embodied or uh, a human archive, you could say, of sorts. And then I had her record collection and and her tapes. So that was sort of my original archive. And later on, as as I decided to form in Karaiku and go, you know, set out on my own to form my own group. Uh, this was before YouTube, right? Uh, you still had to go to say like Tower Records or JNR Music World and search through the bins, and lo and behold, I found some recordings by uh, John John Cohen, and it was an amazing thing for me because this guy I didn't know anything about him. I was just, all I know is this guy he went to Peru, he traveled there, he spent a lot of time there making field recordings. So I don't know what he got out of it. I was like, why did he do this? But I'm glad I'm glad he did it. And it was very important to me because it it started exposing me to actual not musicians, actually, just regular people. Because before my experience has been listening to professional musicians recordings, where his field recordings were no, this is just straight from the people themselves. You know, it's not very polished sounding, but you could, you know, you could feel through the recording the 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 soul and the real essence of these people. And that inspired me to actually start, maybe I can do, you know, my own documentary work one day. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And actually, so that's, and henceforth, I have that, this is actually a picture of us years later with John Cohen, because in thinking about the archive and working on it with Andres, you know, actually at one point he had said, have you ever heard these recordings? It was the, called the Mountain Music of Peru collection. And I said, oh yes, actually a rather, you know, well-known person from my field uh, in the history of my field in folklore, John Cohen, and also a, a you know, a musician uh, did those recordings and he did films. And, um, you know, when Andres told me that that had had such a big impact on him and his ability to learn, you know, from the archive, I was able to contact John. He passed away last year, but we were able to do a program with him several years ago before that, um, where we screened some of his films. And he and Andres had a conversation similar, actually, to the one we're having today. Um, and it was a really meaningful program. So, um, yeah, so that that's a little background. And thank you, Andres, for that you know, that idea thinking about like the embodied archive versus the media archive or the physical archive. And I think, you know, for me, it's really important that we think about that, that we not just think about archiving, certainly as a practice, you know, necessary in education and libraries, but also as, you know, something even more radical, which is, you know, we are archives of ourselves and there's an embodied practice as well. And so um, in, in that same vein, Andres, how would you say working on an archive over these years, starting to do projects, having technology to document the work you and others are doing, having things like YouTube and social media to activate archives and share, how have you felt that that has changed your philosophy and practice as a musician, if at all? Yeah, it was, it was also a big game changer for me. Uh, because I, my original school, folklore school, playing with the previous groups like uh, Tawantinsuyo and Kai, their their philosophy, which I embraced at the time, was, well, we're we're bringing you this this music, and it's very important that we learn this, and present it, so that this knowledge doesn't get lost. So that was kind of driving me for a long time like yeah yeah this is important i'm on a mission to learn as much as i can so that one day i can pass it on to somebody and this information doesn't get lost so i i adopted that i adopted that uh but then <laughs> once i discovered uh youtube and i 
started just looking things up. You know, in the beginning there weren't there was not that much stuff out there, but then I started seeing it was magical, like very indigenous communities in the Andes, in the deep Andes, not from the cities, playing their music, and and dancing their dances. And it, they weren't professional groups, but they hired somebody to like make a high quality video so they could document their identity, their traditions. And I was like, holy, holy smokes, this is a game changer. And it's and it was kind of, it kind of relieved me, you know, it kind of now re removed that sort of burden for me. Like, oh, I have to be, you know, the the one who preserves everything and, and have this huge mission. It, it kind of freed me from so from then on I was no longer the one who had to necessarily be the archiver I was just the messenger between that world you know and and the modern world and the, and the urban world in New York City and also uh, to the future you know I I didn't have the onus of now of of being the authority which I didn't feel comfortable with because God I'm not indigenous I wasn't born there I was born and raised here my first language is English so now I was like no it's fine I can just learn and be the messenger be the interpreter for mm -hmm. everyone else and so on today's my last question to you as we wrap this up and then we'll be able to open it up more for questions and perhaps listen to a little bit more of our music as well um, is in that going off of that idea of being freed in certain ways by these more modern archiving practices. Um, you you mentioned before too that in starting in Karaiku, you were looking to both in sound but also in vision for the group and in kind of in embodied practice for the group. You were looking to do something that was more connected to your own identity and your own experience, right? As being a New Yorker of Indian, indigenous and Andean heritage. And you were sort of waiting for the opportunity to do that in real time. And so going off this idea that the archive kind of empowered that in certain ways, can you tell the audience also just a little bit more about what you're going after in terms of the sound and um, kind of experience for the group? Uh, definitely, definitely. So I was very influenced by my mom, and I came to a realization that, well, at least in Peruvian music, the lyrics are a big deal. But when we, when we're, when I was originally exposed to uh, to Andean music in the streets of New York City, was listening to people, even people I learned that became my friends eventually, you know, playing in the subways in the streets. But it was always instrumentals. So it was beautiful to, of course, to listen to the to the flutes, and some of them dressed also in, in indigenous ways. So it was a visual, visually exciting. But there was no story. There was no, there were no lyrics. Not even in Spanish. It was all just instrumental. And I, I told myself, well, when I do the things my way, no, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do it like that. There has to be. I can't believe that all these traditional songs were just composed as instrumentals. And it turned out my theory was right, that a lot of these melodies, they all have their lyrics. It could be Spanish, and a lot of them are in Quechua or Aymara. It's just that people, for whatever reasons, did not learn it and did not you know, expose it to the rest of the world. So that was a big deal for me. And then... When my, I, I got closer to my mom, because we were had been distanced for a while, but then I got closer to her because I realized, geez, my mom actually speaks Quechua. Maybe I should, like, use this resource <laughs> right here, you know, and to learn Quechua music and Quechua lyrics and learn actually what I'm actually singing about. So that was, that was a beautiful thing that happened. Another thing, actually, it originally just started because for practical reasons. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a revolutionary. Uh, but what happened was we, we had a lot of, in, in the Inca Cusio Sonko group, we had a lot of uh, female dancers and not too many guy dancers. So sometimes even women had to dress like men to play the men's part. But then when we started playing uh, indigenous music together as a, as a collective, it was not, you know, no one was ever even thinking about it like, oh, women are not supposed to play, only the men, because that's how it, it, it is in the old country. It was just like, okay, everybody's just going to learn because we want to do, you know, we the more the better. So it was not really, you know, I wasn't really aware, you know, consciously trying to do this. But then when I look back, I was like, geez, you know, 
maybe I'm the, the first band to act, actually want to include women actually playing inst Andean instruments in a live performance. And it may be true, to be honest with you. I, mm -hmm. I didn't research it, but as far as I can recollect, it may, it may be no, true. I think, yeah, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't like quote ourselves for sure, for sure. But I think in New York or in this area, exactly. it really, yeah, it really was one of the first. Um, and as you could see, even from that video, that documentary piece we played before, that was one of the earliest lineups of the group. And a lot of those guys do continue to be in the band, but there's a much more, um, there's a much larger lineup now that includes a lot of women. But you can see, like, even when the group started, right, the people who knew and the guys that were in the group, it was all men. And then that changed. Yeah. Exactly. And actually, believe it or not, the, the first woman in, in the Incaraiku group was actually Naomi. <laughs> she became my student. And I said, okay, what do you know? What do you know how to play? And she had some background in, in flute. So I was like, that's good enough for me. And she liked to sing. So we, we started with that. We started from like a sort of strengths perspective. Like, what do you bring? And we'll, you know, we'll work with that. You know, and we'll work on the other things that you need to learn. You know, that's how I, how well, I started. We also had other, we had your mother and we had other guests. And then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are women that have joined. The, I mean. But there were more like guest, guest artists. Yeah, but and then we had women that have joined that also had, I think, a, I mean, oh, obviously I'm from a different culture, then. so, you know, we had people that joined and, you know, yes. had a deeper root with the music later on as well. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Now that we had, we had a woman playing the winds, we have a woman now playing uh, percussion, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to, rec to recruit actively actually more women. Uh, it's not easy, but I am actually trying to recruit. So if anybody knows anybody out there, <laughs> women who play Andean music with, in, in, with an instrument, let me know. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, thank you, Andres. And I think that that, you know, speaks a bit to some of the things that have impacted the group and the sound. And I also think that idea of infusing personal experience, you know, that like I think traditional music is so timeless because even though the music doesn't necessarily change, it's interpreted differently. And I know one thing for me, you know, case in point, bringing up that yeah, I used to be in the group and that you know, it was a really beautiful experience, but also something that made me confident to do that and made me comfortable to do that was that you really, you know, part of your, it wasn't just that you, you know, thought, oh, I'll put some people from another background in my group and it will be cool. You really had, you had a concept, right? That you wanted a diverse kind of New York City experience to be a part of the performance, a part of the sound, a part of the way the group presented, even if the majority of members were from um, Andean backgrounds, you wanted to also bring in other, other elements. And for you, it wasn't about watering down the tradition. It was about being authentically yourself, right? As, as, a, as a New Yorker as well. And so I think in closing, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that, but that was something that I think has been very important to this group over the years as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. First, I want to address the comment. Yes, I am aware of Sukai, that, but they were on the West Coast, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, But Quentin Howard, I think she married the, the Bolivian charango player from, from Potosi, I think. He is from a seminal group called Savia Andina, I believe, and from, from the place where my wife is from in Bolivia, Potosi. So, yes, I was aware of Sukai. Sorry about that. So I guess, yeah, maybe just, it's just an East Coast. <laughs> maybe we're just the first in the East Coast. But Quentin Howard, yeah, those were, those were pros, you know, they were very, they were very polished at their instruments. Our, our beginning groups were, you know, we're like a learning type of group. I'm teaching, you know, it's a little, I guess, a different philosophy, you could say. And personal experience. So this is how I, 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 I saw things. And looking back, also, I in the old in the older groups where I was in, uh, I always I I loved the music, and I love what we were doing, but I always felt a little out of place, because believe it or not, you know, Spanish was not my first language, and I struggled with Spanish, and I I they they you know they made me feel alienated. They would tease me, and that bothered me a lot. Uh, but it also you know just you know alienated me even more. And I realized, I guess, you know, we have a lot of things in common, but I'm not like them exactly. And they, and they have a lot of different philosophies, like, for example, no women playing, you know, instruments, right? 
So when I decided to do things my way and form my own group, I realized, well, I have to, to, to tell my own story from my perspective. You know, I'm not, I wasn't born in Peru. I wasn't born in the mountains. I'm not going to try to perpetuate that mythology because it's, it's, it's nonsense. I'm not going to lie to people, you know. I'm going to say, look, listen, this is who I am. I'm from here. I, I was lucky enough to be exposed to this and maybe through my family and friends. And now I'm here to, as a messenger to bring this mu music to you. I'm going to speak it to you in your Brooklyn language because, I, you know, we could be, I could do it in Spanish, of course, and maybe somewhat in Quechua, but predominantly when we present, we're acting as our true personas, right? I don't have a, you know, what you see from me is what you get. I'm, I don't have a persona. This is me. So how I'm talking to you now, this is how I relate to people on stage. And I hope people, you know, capture that because I'm from Brooklyn, right? <laughs> I'm not going to try to pr play the part of, a, of an immigrant from, you know, from the Andes. No, I said, no, that's not me. Maybe my parents, but this is who we are. And coincidentally, like it wasn't planned, but all my friends and disciples who are in the group now, they they're the same. They are also born here and the children of Im Peruvian immigrants or Ecuadorian or Bolivian immigrants. And they share these commonalities with me. Uh, a lot of them also, you know, struggle with Spanish because it was not the, taught to them, you know, in, in the home and that sort of thing. So this, this type of personal experience at, you know, at first, in the old world was you could have looked at it as a negative but now I'm, I had to embrace my true identity right and then form the identity of Inca Raico it's like well I'm not that so why would I try to be that I have to be who I really am and I'm not the mission of Inca Raico is still the same but I have to it has to start with me and accepting who my true identity is and that was a you know a watershed moment for me yeah Okay, thank you, Andres, um, and thank you, everyone, for your wonderful questions thus far. Um, this does complete the formal part of our presentation, so Iveta, you can let us know if there are more questions or if you want us to play any song samples. Uh, well, I, I can uh, give you uh, the two questions that I have, and then uh, we can end the, with the song. Sure. What do you say? Sure. All right, um, Evelyn actually um, put her question in the chat. Um, question was, did women had any part in music making before the arrival of Europeans? I will change Europeans into Spanish because not all Europeans arrived in South America. My ancestors didn't. <laughs> so if, uh, if you can answer this question and there will be one more to be the last one. From what I know and what I have studied, uh, primarily uh, women were either singing or playing certain percussion instruments. It was rare to yeah to for them to play flutes, or once the Spanish came to play string instruments. Mm -hmm. It was rare, but I but I believe it happened. But yeah, it was a rarity. But normally it was mostly singing. And then of course. And women would be singing and men would be playing the instruments. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Yes. All right. Uh, Evelyn, does this answer your question? You can unmute yourself. Thank you. I have two screens, so I have to move the, the cursor from one to the other. Thank you so much. Um, that's, that's, I really appreciate what you're doing. And, um, and you know, it, it made me think how one sometimes takes things for granted. When I was way much younger. I had the opportunity to roommate with a woman from Peru. And uh, and through her and her and other Peruvians, I came across a lot of Indian music from, I also had a friend who had a roommate from Bolivia. This is a long time ago, studying in Eastern Europe. And so that's when I became familiar with um, Aymara, with Indian mu music in general and, and dances. and um, and to me, first of all, it was spectacularly beautiful. Um, the Scena, the Sampoña, the voices, the instrumentation and everything. I thought it was spectacular. And when I heard you talking about some urbanite <laughs> dismissing it, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that had happened. So I really salute what you've been doing 
and the, the work of rescuing um it's it's necessary and and um and also salute the fact that you you know decided to learn quechua and move forward nowadays in most higher ed institution there is some quechua learning more quechua than aymara you are right there is, seems to be aymara has been more like this but like i know nyu holds um tables in quechua and i know UPenn has an indian region conference and i think some of the events happen in indigenous language i don't know if they have a quechua table learning but uh, music should be part of it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah pen they do they they had a full-time person for a while and now they have fulbright scholars from peru who usually come and teach quechua instruction good that's good, good. that's good it's good all right, then uh, the last question is about these connections that you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation. You said that you um, um, included uh, groups from New Jersey and work with Pepe Santana. Um, ah, and by the way, for everyone, we have a virtual program with Pepe Santana on December 8th, <laughs> if you want to join us. That's in parentheses. And then, um, uh, the question would be whether you intend to expand on these connections because there's groups in, in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, down to Delaware, Maryland, Washington, DC, and a kind of connect uh, through this project. Yeah, so I'll, I can answer a little bit of that and then Andres can also feel free to add. Um, so we do have we do have a connection to Pepe Santana. In fact, uh, Andres he was a teacher of Andres, and also Andres was in his group in Kai at different times. Um, so there is that musical and and sort of um, creative lineage there for sure. Um, and Pepe also used to be part of Tawantin Suyu, which was one of the first major um, groups to play this music in the New York area. Um, so we we do have that connection and. In terms of the Urban Condors project, the archive and you know the programs that we hope to do, I would say, yes, we do hope to expand, particularly with New Jersey, uh, where there is such a large Andean uh, and you know Quechua, Quechua, Aymara speaking population, um, we would consider that you know a direct part of this. And in terms of other groups, you know, sprinkled throughout the mid-Atlantic or the country, I would say we're definitely open to it. I think the project has been very much about the NYC tri-state area and that particular story and history, but it's not closed off necessarily in any way. And I think, you know, we're very much about, um, you know, building out, building out these connections, because I think as Andres mentioned, something he said that was always meaningful to me too, is that, you know, sometimes, especially in like the music industry or even like the folklore world, something people will ask me or ask Andres is, well, how can you play music from three different countries? How can you be traditional if you don't play one genre from like one specific place? And I think that that's a very like Western kind of academic or folklore, you know, sort of notion that um, we need to have like those boundaries up. And for this music, because it is an indigenous music and because, you know, it predates all these national borders, that's that's why and that's how, and that's why there are these connections and this kinship through music. Um, and so in that same vein, even when we talk about, you know, a New York City history, we're recognizing that that's very porous with New Jersey um, and with other, you know, surrounding counties and states. Um, so I guess that's that's how I would answer that question. Andres, I don't know if you want to add anything. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, a, a bad thing turned into a good thing. Like the, pan the pandemic made me realize why was I limiting myself to just New York City? Now, now that we through Zoom and you know live streaming, we can do events that link us to the to the whole world. Because I, you know, I didn't, I was ignorant about this technology. I had never used it, you know, even to my phone. So that that's what I learned. And it's like, yeah, of course, if people could be here live with us, that's great. But we can, you know, we can we can share and link, and you know, network with people all over the world. Well, of course, here in the tri-state area, you know, we could do, I want to do events. I want to document events as well. I can't, I can't always maybe be there in person, but because of the power of technology, for me, now the possibilities are, are endless. 
because lo logistically there was always an issue but now that for me anyway that's like that's no longer an issue we can let's get together let's connect just as long as the time so, zones are similar excellent. yes because <laughs> right? otherwise that's a problem yes you know? that is quite well, i wanted cool. to mention before i forget and you uh you can put in the the website so you we were mentioning uh places to learn quechua actually naomi f helped found the quechua collective of new york with my mother and that is a a school and they do offer online uh, education for quechua at basic level and and a more advanced level so that's that's also you know we're not in the ivy league network but we know all those people and they're all they're our friends so we're just putting it out that out there wonderful thank you very much andres and naomi let us uh let us uh, wrap it up with a song okay i just put the um Ketra collectives uh, address in the chat and I think Marcy will also share uh, the group's information so I'm going to play a song from actually our new album which was kind of an archival project in and of itself it took us a while to uh, finish it and get it out there um, but it is available and um, Andres what do you prefer I play Carnavales or San Juanitos? Uh, let, let's do San Juanitos since that's uh, people seem to be mentioning that today Okay. <laughs> and this is a uh, we sing in Quechua and in Spanish in this one Quechua. Okay.
that was simply wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And this really is a, a great way to end a, a conference. Do you have any concluding words to say? I mean, I'd just like to say thank, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, I was gonna say thank you to, to Yvette and to Wheaton, Marcy, everyone in the audience. Um, we get a chance to play gigs a lot and do educational workshops and kind of put this work into practice, but we don't necessarily get a lot of chances to talk about it in these spaces. Um, so at least, you know, that's something I wanted to say was, you know, thank you. And it's been a, it's been a joy to share it in this context. I, I just want to say that one of my missions is also is when I perform is I just want to reach the people and because I think this music is beautiful. I just happen to be lucky that I that I have this ancestry, you know, DNA, whatever. I'm lucky, but there are people in my, in my group and Naomi was an example. They're not from the Andes, but that's they were still part of my group. So it doesn't matter. And like the, the bottom line is like in watching the other videos that we were watching before with Evelyn, uh, is, all this music is beautiful. All this stuff is so beautiful. Why would you? And this is why it makes me sad. Is why would you be ashamed of this? Why would you put this down? I mean, you have to evaluate that. <laughs> Just from a yeah. musical point of view, it's like, this stuff is beautiful. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is. I think everyone it. agreed. Everyone in the audience agreed with you. If you can just uh, see what is uh, coming in the chat, you will see <laughs> that everyone agreed with you. <laughs> so everyone should be proud, you know? Yes, yes. And I mean, do you I have think... a word to say? Yeah, I mean, that um, I think that the people may even being conditioned to think that this is not yes. beautiful as a trauma, yes. as a historical trauma. And so we need to heal by being exposed and, yes. and having had the opportunity to appreciate. I mean, really, I when you said that, that some people said that you should not like, I was like, how could you not like something so amazingly beautiful? But afterwards, when you gave the present, you, you, you answered it, like, you know, from yes. urban nights and so on, there is so... And then I realized, of course, Evelyn. So, yeah, keep sure. on going, keep on doing it, keep and on. And people are learning. People are also learning. Yeah, people are learning. But so it's it's, uh, it's going to be better and better. Uh, I'm always the optimist here. <laughs> Have to. <laughs> Thank There's you so very much. Thank you. I mean, all of uh, you. There's a lot Thank of trauma you. and shame, and that's so that's my mission. I want you, at the very least, don't be ashamed. Just enjoy it. We're not on this planet for very long, you know. Don't don't do it. There's it was no point. Yeah. Be proud. True. <laughs> very true. Thank you, Andres. Uh, Naomi and Evelyn, it was wonderful indeed. Marcy, Marcy, do you have uh, uh, oh, I'm something? just sharing I'm just sharing the information that I put into the chat and to remind everyone that um, if they go to the do their documents folder, uh, they should have a Zoom folder in there and and hopefully they will automatically download the uh, chat from today so they can come away with all those wonderful links and continue to listen to this wonderful music. And I uh, also noted in the um, in the chat that this is uh, an opportunity for pro professional development for teachers and that I shared your information about us so that people could reach out to you and and get that certificate. Yeah. Other than that, thank you all so very much and enjoy your weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Thank you.